Welcome to uh, our report rollout. Josh, let me begin by saying that our board member, Marcus Noland, wishes you all the best. He congratulates you for uh, another fantastic report. He's unable to join us today, but he uh, looks forward to the video recording. So uh, again, um, it is with uh, great pleasure that I introduce our report author and panelist today. Uh, Josh Stanton um, has just completed the second report for HRNK. This is the report we're launching today. Uh, previously, he was uh, the author of Arsenal of Terror, North Korea State Sponsor of Terrorism. Uh, this is a report that was credited for much more than just highlighting uh, North Korea as a state sponsor of terror. It played a critical role in the relisting of North Korea as a state sponsor of terror, and it set the standard, the legal standard for the listing of a state as a sponsor of terror. Of course, Josh is very well known within our um, Korean Peninsula Studies circle. Uh, he has been an attorney for a few decades now with uh, experience in military and civilian um, criminal uh, civil litigation and uh, administrative law. He served as a U.S. Army judge advocate in Seoul, in Daegu, in Pyeongtaek, uh, in South Korea. Uh, he has been um, authoring and managing the One Free Korea blog for many years. He's been doing this on his personal time. Uh, he has been widely published in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Daily Telegraph, many other publications. Um, Josh, uh, it, it's absolutely delightful to to be featuring your um, your latest report. Uh, thank you so much for doing this with uh, HRNK. Uh, let me credit uh, members of our team. I'm sure you'll do the same, Raymond Ha. Uh, Director of Operations and Research, as well as Maria Carmen Corte for their good and hard work uh, with you on uh, getting this report finalized. So the time is short. We'll just go to you, sir. Go ahead. Greg, thank you <clears throat> so much for hosting this event. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I really owe great thanks to Raymond Ha and Maria Del Carmen Corte for her work all the way up to last night uh, working on the report. Um, I have to give the mandatory disclaimer that the views I expressed today are solely my own. Ten years after the UN Commission of Inquiry released its landmark report, North Korea continues to commit what the commission called the inhumane act of knowingly causing prolonged starvation. And that is a crime against humanity. And in fact, I would argue that no crime has killed or harmed or bereaved more North Koreans than this one. North Korea's hunger situation today is as bad as it has been at any time since the Great Famine. And that is not because a series of 30 consecutive meteorological miracles caused floods or droughts to afflict only that half of Korea that is north of the DMZ. It is because of the actions of North Korea's government, a blockade of cross-border trade, an internal blockade on trade between counties and provinces, the destruction of private agriculture, the confiscation of wealth from private traders, a new crackdown on markets and private trade, kicking out aid workers, making it impossible to monitor the food aid that Kim Jong-un does not accept, calling it poison candy the rejection of offers of vaccines, and most culpably of all, the export of food to China and Russia for hard currency while the people go hungry. North Korea has passed up so many historic opportunities to open up and reform, uh, including during the administrations of the most pro-engagement presidents in US and South Korean history, Donald Trump and Moon Jae-in. We have returned to record levels of missile testing. For a year, we have been warned of an imminent nuclear test. 
China and Russia have never been less cooperative with restraining North Korea. They are violating UN sanctions, sanctions they voted for on imports of North Korean coal and minerals and food and textiles and forced labor. And they are aiding and abetting North Korea's smuggling. How did we get here? And what does the history tell us? Well, in 1995, as the report describes in great detail, citing the specific regulations, President Clinton gave North Korea not only aid and food aid and fuel oil and light water reactors, but it also lifted on sanctions that affected transactions for travel and telecommunications and overflight rights. It agreed to import North Korean minerals, including magnesite. And most importantly, it authorized dollar clearing transactions through our financial system. In 2007, George W. Bush signed a second agreed framework in which North Korea again promised that in exchange for sanctions relief, it would disarm. And in 2012, President Obama offered North Korea the Leap Day deal, a less ambitious test freeze in exchange uh, for food aid. North Korea reneged on that agreement within weeks. Can I have slide one, please? What you see in slide one is the history of North Korea's sanctions enforcement expressed in terms of raw number of designations. <clears throat> As you see, it goes all the way back to 2004 up to last year. The blue bars are just numbers of designations. Don't tell qualitatively what the designations are. They don't tell us uh, things like penalties on banks. They don't tell us that because there are no penalties on banks. Uh, the key to the Obama administration's effective enforcement of Iran sanctions uh, was the enforcement of sanctions against European banks, including by levying nine-digit civil penalties against those that violated our Iran sanctions. That brought Iran back to the bargaining table. We have never imposed a significant penalty against any bank for violating North Korea's sanctions, despite the fact that we know from UN panel of experts reports and from Justice Department documents that they are. Note what you see there in 2016, when we entered the era of what Donald Trump called maximum pressure. This, this actually began before Donald Trump entered office, as you know, after the passage of the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act, it ended about the time that Kim Jong-un offered Donald Trump a summit in Singapore and President Trump took to Twitter and canceled two rounds of sanctions designations. We have since then returned to historic low levels of sanctions enforcement that we have not seen since the early years of the Obama administration. But I ask you, if the steward of the world's financial system does not enforce sanctions, who will? <clears throat> Since 2018, the Treasury Department has allowed the effects of sanctions that were initially significant to wither away. Sanctions have a half-life. North Korea is highly adaptable, and sanctions that are not enforced and seen through uh, will fade away given time. The sanctions that we have seen in recent years have been largely performative. They have designated entities with only limited connections to the international financial system, and often they are simply low-level actors. By any reasonable measure, the Treasury Department has neglected its North Korea sanctions program since mid-2018. That is a bipartisan failure. Now, I know this is a busy slide. So brace yourselves and take a minute to take it in because there's a lot going on here. The blue bars are again, the raw number of designations. What you see in the black arrows at the top, <clears throat> these are the UN Security Council sanctions that have been imposed over the years. Below the chronology at the bottom, those red arrows are major North Korean provocations. Those are nuclear tests or significant uh, attacks against uh, foreign interests. In green, what you see uh, recorded is North Korea's diplomatic engagement. So 
What I posit from this is that there are a few historical correlations you see. But first, I want to make note of something, which is that North Korea has long maintained the narrative that sanctions don't affect it, and it's not afraid of our sanctions, and it has said this very publicly. North Korea is a system where people do not like to deliver bad news to Kim Jong-un, and what people had no doubt been telling Kim Jong-un all, uh, all throughout the years between 2011, when he took power, and 2018, when sanctions first started to show effects on the North Korean economy, is that the sanctions would have no effect. Around the time that it became clear that the sanctions were having an effect, Kim Jong-un, who had never met a foreign leader, suddenly became interested in meeting Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Moon Jae-in and three times Donald Trump. This is similar to the pattern that we saw between 2005, when we first imposed the effective Banco Delta Asia sanction, and 2007, when North Korea came back to the bargaining table and signed a second agreed framework. There is a positive correlation between effective sanctions enforcement and more diplomatic engagement. And one certainly cannot say that effective enforcement has been harmful to our diplomatic efforts. When appeased, North Korea continues to nuke up quietly. When ignored, North Korea nukes up loudly. And when sanctioned, North Korea negotiates, or at least pretends to. But its negotiation is always aimed at denying us the leverage that we need to hold it to its word. And it has been very successful in using negotiation and diplomacy to deny us leverage by lifting sanctions, as opposed to finding other ways to incentivize negotiation while holding it to its word. We don't have the leverage that we need to negotiate a durable peace with North Korea because we have not taken advantage of the authorities that Congress has given the president. We have failed to designate some of North Korea's largest money laundering fronts, such as GLOCOM, the few designations that we have imposed recently have been qualitatively insignificant. We have never sanctioned a major bank for violating North Korea sanctions. Designations numerically are near record lows, and the president has never taken advantage of the many anti-smuggling authorities that Congress gave the president in the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act. Now, I want to address calls for sanctions relief which come up periodically, China and Russia, for example, have proposed to lift sanctions on dual-use machinery exports and technology transfers to North Korea. They have proposed lifting sanctions on North Korea's export of, of statues and political monuments, chiefly to Africa, which amount to an export of kleptocracy. They want to lift sanctions on textiles and the forced labor that makes them in Chinese sweatshops where they are often exported to the United States, as we learn from customs documents. They want to lift sanctions most culpably on seafood, which China and Russia want to buy at a discount while the people of North Korea go hungry. But to those who call for sanctions relief, I ask, which sanctions would you lift? Would these be the sanctions on the front companies that fund North Korea's military industrial complex and WMD programs? Or would those be the sanctions on coal, much of it mined in political prison camps like camps 14 and 18, and that are used to pay for the munitions industry division that runs North Korea's ballistic missile programs? Or would those be sanctions on the exports of other minerals that fund the internal security services that maintain the system of domestic terror, or the exports, exports on food that raise cash for the oligarchy while the poor go hungry. These are not forms of sanctions relief that Congress would easily accept. And that almost exhausts the list of what the sanctions are, leaving really only oil sanctions, to which I admit they should not be a priority. They are hard to enforce, and they may have secondary effects on the population. 
but North Korea has done nothing to earn sanctions relief. A second myth about North Korea sanctions or sanctions generally is that they are self-executing, that we can simply vote for a resolution or pass a law and call it done. They require constant tending, enforcement, and investigation. This often requires years of work, and it is not work that snaps back. Sanctions are not an affront to North Korea's sovereignty, but an expression of our sovereignty. They are a statement that our financial system that we built and that we regulate will not be a place to commit crime or to threaten our security or commit crimes against humanity. No nation has a sovereign right to use our banking system to do these things. Sanctions are not a simple dial that we turn from zero to 11 to punish a state. They are an array of criminal and forfeiture laws, some of which are arguably not sanctions at all, and blocking authorities and export controls and five separate special measures to prevent money laundering. They may be applied separately or in tandem, depending on a target. And they are not a binary choice to either collapse a bank or to grant it immunity, as the Obama administration's very effective sanctions enforcement showed when it used these authorities carefully to, against European banks to bring Iran back to the bargaining table. When combined with forfeiture authority, sanctions are increasingly a tool to fight kleptocracy and compensate victims. The FBI, the Justice Department, and the World Bank are very proficient at tracing assets and freezing them and forfeiting them and returning them to their rightful owners. Congress has a role. Currently, statutes that I explain in detail in the report dictate how forfeited funds and fines and penalties are spent. Congress must make changes in order to allow some of this money to go back to the North Korean people. For years, since I have been watching North Korea, Congress has been asking the State Department to fund freedom of information programs and refugee assistance. And it has never done this to Congress's satisfaction. Congress must learn to use the Anti-Deficiency Act to set aside funds and a special fund that makes it illegal for the State Department to use these funds for any purpose other than that dictated by Congress. And finally, we must stop allowing ourselves to be confused by North Korea's human shield strategy that uses the population of the country, the poor and the hungry as shields to protect itself and its kleptocratic priorities. This is a false choice. If we lift sanctions on kleptocracy, we will get more kleptocracy. If we lift sanctions on crime, we will get more crime. And if we lift sanctions on proliferation, we will get more proliferation. We must reach the root of all evil. We must return the wealth of the North Korean people to its rightful owners, the people of the country. And to those who now say that we must accept North Korea as a nuclear state, let me ask you to consider where this leads. Already we see a growing calls, a growing number of calls for South Korea to acquire its own nuclear arsenal. That will have a domino effect in the region and the world. And what would Pyongyang do as a nuclear state? This is, after all, the state that proliferated ballistic missile technology to Iran and Syria, that sold manned portable surface-to-air missiles to Iran, allegedly for the use of terrorists, that built a nuclear reactor in a part of Syria that came under the control of ISIS for several years that assisted Syria with its chemical weapons programs and used VX nerve agent in a crowded airport terminal in Malaysia to murder Kim Jong-nam, that carried out a cyber terrorist attack against our own country, that attacked South Korea twice in 2010, killing 50 of its people, and that continues to claim legitimacy to rule all of Korea. These are not the actions of a state that would be a responsible nuclear power. And we should know by now that no piece of paper, no armistice, no non-proliferation treaty, no agreed framework, no resolution can or ever has restrained North Korea's drive for nuclear hegemony in Korea. 
we must give North Korea no choice but to adopt a food first policy by joining with the same coalition that is patrolling the waters near North Korea today in a financial coalition that will direct the money, the wealth of the country back to the people of North Korea. As we speak today, France and Germany and Canada and Japan and New Zealand and Australia have already joined us in patrolling the waters near North Korea where it smuggles coal and other sanctioned goods. I posit that we can, we can gain a greater reward, a lower risk by joining these countries, these issuers of convertible currencies into a financial coalition than simply by using them as a military one. The leadership of this president united the world uh, in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and it can unite the world before a food crisis, before another famine strikes North Korea. There is little time to lose. This is what we must do because the choice is a global metastasis of proliferation and suffering and famine for the people of all of Korea. Thank you. Josh, thank you. What a powerful statement, straightforward, powerful, persuasive. Once again, Josh Stanton, the root of all evil, money, rice, crime and law in North Korea, now available on our website, hrnk.org under publications. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to our first discussant, Sue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Sue Kim um, is a specialist in nonproliferation, East Asian security, North Korean leadership, inter-Korean relations, uh, the U.S.-South Korea alliance, uh, propaganda of authoritarian regimes, nuclear nonproliferation, illicit networks, uh, homeland security, you name it. Uh, Sue hails from the um, intelligence community. She has also been an analyst with the RAND Corporation. She's well known for um, her the, the article she has published in um, um, various uh, newspapers and journals. She's also well known for the quotes she has provided to um, mainstream publications on uh, very relevant Korean Peninsula issues. So we're absolutely delighted that you joined us today. Let me turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. So I read this report and there were so many thoughts that entered my mind. And aside from the, the technical sharpness, what I took away from this, there were three things. Um, one of course is um, corruption of the North Korean regime. I think that's very apparent to all of us um, who joined this conversation today, where the regime is, where the North Korean country is and where the North Korean people are as a result of the corruption that is rampant, that is really innate to the lives and, and the purpose of the Kim regime. Going back a little bit deeper or I guess more expansive, the other thing that really, that was still on my mind is, is the idea of culpability as well as agency. And I, I, I honed in on this because we know, and it's very apparent to us that the North Korean regime, AKA the Kim Jong-un family and Kim Jong-un, they are culpable for the system that it has created. They're culpable for the starvation that the North Korean people are suffering. They're culpable for the the treatment that the country is getting um, as a result of the brutalities that are persisting. There's also this question about agency that goes with it. And there's this perception that, as, as Josh mentioned, that sanctions are intended to, or they have this secondary effect of affecting the lives of the North Korean population. And if we understand the design of sanctions, um, the purpose of that is not to hurt the North Korean people. It is to actually stop and to deter the North Korean leadership from persisting in its ways. But the idea of culpability and agency, I think hits not only in the regime, but also we also as citizens have our part. And I pulled quotes actually directly from the report. I wanna read them, maybe not line by line, but because it, it, it was just so, um, there was this like reverberating remnant that, that just kept entering my mind when I was reading this report, the first thing is, there's this one part where you say, um, this paper argues that 
every crisis emanating from North Korea, its crimes against humanity, the WMD programs, the global arms trade and proliferation, the hacking and financial crimes is inextricably intertwined with its kleptocracy and corruption. And in North Korea, the money is the root of all evil. And consequently, each of these crises points to a common set of legal and diplomatic strategies that targets all of them at their common source. And you mentioned our willful or negligent choices to facilitate Pyongyang's actions to our financial access to our financial system, um, our commerce, our technology, and our economy. So we know that the the main culpable party here is the North Korean regime. But we also have our part. We also need to do our part into ensuring that these practices are not left condoned. And I do agree with this report that uh, because of various national interests, there's also um, changes in leadership in, in democracies where we don't see continuity in policy sometimes that prevent us from making progressive progress. That's two words. Uh, uh, making progress towards you know, rooting out what is really the systemic problem, the persistent challenge of dealing with North Korea. And we have a part in it. And for various reasons that are not really in the best interests of the North Korean population, we let this happen and we turn a blind eye to it. We, we impose policies and, and Josh, I think you used the word performative um, when we were talking about sanctions, but I think policy sometimes also is performative. It doesn't really, it barely scratches the surface of what really needs to get done in not just the North Korea problem, but I think in, in many foreign policy challenges. So that left me with, with a lot of thoughts about some of the challenges that we face and, and the ways that we've been trying to approach the problem, especially right now, as we're dealing not only with the nuclear on North Korea, but we're still dealing with Russia versus Ukraine. We're still dealing with US-China competition. We're also dealing with economic difficulties around the world. So tough choices have to be made. And I think that given the persistence of the North Korean threat, let's also not forget that the country is, you know, it it, it becomes a laughing stock. And we have images of Kim Jong-un where, you know, it's it's a caricature. And sometimes we don't take this seriously um, for, for various reasons, but we also have our burden, I think, of responsibility as, as, as citizens of this world. If we are intent on changing policy, if we're in really intent on changing the lives of the North Korean population, then there is a part of our own culp culpability as well. We're, we're, not really, we're not really calling it as it is, I would say. And then the other, um, thought I had was when you mentioned corruption, Kim Jong-un, and you honed in on this as well in the report, you said that he's both the perpetrator and the victim of corruption. And that's a really interesting just juxtaposition because we know he's the perpetrator. Where's this victim coming from? But you, you, you capture it so well that he directs the corruption essential to the state's cohesion and his survival. And there's this corruption that he can't really extirpate that degrades its cohesion and ultimately threatens his survival. So Kim, in his mind, he justifies his policies, his practices, because he is the victim of US hostile policies of South Korea's um, you know, alliance with the United States. But again, that's how he portrays the world. It pits him against the rest of us. Um, it, also pits Kim against his officials. So we're not just looking at the North Korean leadership system that abuses and violates you know, the rights of its citizens, but it's Kim versus the different layers and rungs, I think, of, of North Korean society. And, and to portray Kim Jong-un as a victim and a perpetrator, I thought was it was goosebump inducing because it's it's precise and, and in some ways that's how we as Korea watchers, if we're really looking at Kim Jong-un and the regime and the system, I think properly, that would be the way to look at it. There's also this question about agency and it, it goes back to um, corruption and culpability is that um, the reframing of not just sanctions, but the reframing of the North Korean problem, it 
again, in your report, you mentioned that it, it shifts the choice away um, from the agency of those who actually have the responsibility and the capability for framing it. And I would say that the agency is not just on the part of Kim, but again, it's also on the part of those, those of us who are looking into the North Korea problem. And we've been hammering away at it. We've been chipping away at it into this thing that we are looking at right now, where there's so many complexities. It seems like a very easy problem to solve when you actually realize where the root of the problem is. The challenge, of course, is, is, is in coordinating policy interests as well as the national interests. And again, this, it was a huge wake up call, not just for um, folks who are learning about North Korea, but even for folks like myself, who've you know, looked at North Korea for, for, for a few years uh, to, to really reshape. And I think to, to re-pivot and realign um, my understanding of North Korea, but also how we're looking at North Korea as, as a country, as institutions, um, as, as a global community, uh, but also as I think um, individual contributors, um, we're, we're very passionate about this topic and we're, we want things to change for North Korean people. But how are we looking at this problem and what is our understanding of the regime and, and the sole purpose of its existence, as well as the utility of sanctions? So, this this report answered so many questions, but I think it also left us with more questions that needed to be addressed, maybe not factually, but in terms of the morals and the ethics that should be guiding our decisions and the way that we are looking at the problem and the way that we're trying to solve the North Korea issue. Um, so that's my, my biggest takeaway, and um, it was really, truly a privilege um, and, and an honor to be able to read this report, but also to be a discussant. Sue, thank you very much. Corruption, accountability, culpability. We, we have been talking about a paradigm shift in our approach to North Korea. These issues must be part of the messaging that's included in information campaigns uh, aiming to reach out to the people of North Korea. And Josh's report is going to make a big difference in that regard. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to go to um, William Bill Newcomb. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Bill has been um, a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, he's a visiting scholar at George Washington University. Most importantly, um, 12 years ago, then UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon appointed him to serve on the panel of experts established pursuant to the UN Security Council Resolution 1874 of 2009. He stayed on the panel as an expert on finance until 2014. Uh, he has been a uh, U.S. government economist uh, with the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where he was senior economic advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis. And Bill has... Uh, studied economic developments in North Korea practically for more than three decades. He was a deputy coordinator of the U.S. State Department's North Korea Working Group, and he's also a U.S. Army veteran. Bill, on to you. Thank you, sir. Oh, Greg, thank you very much. And I want to thank HRNK and, and notice a great pleasure for me to be invited to discuss this paper. My truth in advertising. I've known and respected Josh Stanton for a number of years and knew of him and his work long before I ever met him. So this report is being released at a critical juncture and I won't elaborate on that as I think all the attendees realize where, we, where we're at diplomatically, militarily um, with North Korea. Now, I wanna note that this report is dramatically well-researched. And it's, the research is grounded in an extensive uh, footnotes that, that document the sources. So if you have a question about something uh, Josh says, it's very easy to go to the source and, and, and see um, how, how you uh, understand it and whether you concur with it or we want to modify it or what. I mean, it just makes this report so much richer in content to have that. Now, I'm not gonna dissect the report, but I'm gonna comment on it 
from my perception. Um, now Josh begins his report with an accounting of the tragic avoidable famine of the 90s, the cruel slow death of perhaps millions from starvation and associated diseases, the collapse of the state administered economy, which removed the implicit safety net uh, that had been supporting workers and their families, and the evident indifference of the elite to the desperate plight of so many. Only after famine spread and worsened to include cases of starvation in the Korean People's Army, did the regime reach out to the international community for relief. Even then, there's no evidence that the leadership also drew upon its own funds used to maintain princely lifestyles. Furthermore, the regime placed significant restriction on international aid providers that prohibited access to sensitive parts of the country. Regrettably, the WFP and others accepted these restraints on activities, a unique concession, if memory serves, and one that allowed the state to resurrect important control measures. The events of this period, called by North Korean authorities the arduous march, were crimes against humanity as documented in the report of the Committee of Inquiry and provided ample evidence of the deep corruption afflicting all levels and aspects of the country, including an explosion of illicit activities, narco-trafficking, counterfeiting, fraud, etc. I believe it's crucially important to begin this report with this account. At this time, at this place, why? Because the famine crossed a critical threshold from localized to national, especially in urban areas 30 years ago, when many officials and staffers in today's administration and Congress were likely too young for this event to imprint itself as it did on my colleagues and I who were so deeply involved. Sanctions, pressure, and invasion make up a, a large section of Josh's report. And I wanna confess that uh, Josh's account of the history of sanctions on North Korea made me grip my teeth, clench my fists, even though I know the story well. He makes clear that the sanctions resolutions themselves, the content and targets, are not the failure so many like to trumpet. Both UN and unilateral sanctions have gotten tougher over time, eliminated loopholes, and increased coverage of revenue earning activities that support prohibited programs. He makes equally clear that the ineffectiveness of sanctions to bring North Korea into meaningful diplomatic negotiations, which actually is their aim, is attributable to first, the failure of UN member states to correctly implement and rigorously enforce them. Second, a failure of leadership in like-minded countries to press forward aggressively using their own laws and regulations. And I'll add a third touched upon in the text of his proposed legislation, a shortage of effective assistance to improve sanctions enforcement by capacity challenged nations. Lack of capacity and lack of political will often are identified as the root causes of lackluster results of sanctions. Lack of capacity includes having only a small overworked contingent of diplomats at the UN who often are unaware and inattentive to UN Security Council actions on the North Korean issue. An understandable narrow focus on issues of political and economic national interest scarce interest in resources to apply to the problem North Korea presents, and a resource-constrained ability to train legal, banking, and customs officials. This is a vulnerability in the international trade and finance system that North Korea effectively and ruthlessly exploits. Then there's political will. This is not solely an issue of political leaders and officials in Africa repaying North Korea for support uh, with arms of its liberation movements, or sympathetic support for a nation willing to confront Western powers. If you want examples of that, look at some of the voting records on human rights in the UN General Assembly. It's not just North Korea's ability to exploit local corruption for its own ends. Lack of political will 
infects many countries for a variety of reasons, including members of the like-minded group, even the United States in my view. To answer the question of why eludes me, I suspect an inability to sort out conflicting priorities is one reason. And I'm convinced that a ranking of priorities is the reason complicit banks in China have been spared from an OFAC listing. The record of the US shows long periods of inattention to North Korean issues, diversion of supposedly dedicated resources to other tasks, silencing of North Korean violation in interest of other objectives, very evident in negotiations with Iran, for example, and decisions to, in effect, kick the can down the road that have brought us this dangerous situation we're in today. This record shows why past legislation that Joss was involved with are necessary and why new legislation is vital. The nature of the North Korean problem itself shows why an all of government approach is the only way to proceed. Joss Stanton, using his talents, knowledge and expertise has offered a legislative way forward that holds promise of gradually bringing change, both to eventually overcoming the, the current diplomatic impasse and importantly, to the improvement in the lives of North Korean people themselves. Gains at first may be hard won, but perseverance achieved by overarching agreement and support from one administration to the next could possibly, and one Congress from one Congress to the next, could possibly attain a significant payoff. Maybe you want to look at it like compound interest benefits your financial position. While all the proposed legislation package in Josh's report may not be politically attainable at this time, in my view, it's urgent to begin the process of exploring them with the administration, the Hill, and our like-minded allies. Thank you all very much. I really encourage you to acquire, read, share, and discuss this report. Thank you, Greg. Bill, thank you very much. Terrific. Lack of capacity and political will. Uh, we've seen this so often over the, 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 the recent month, uh, this willingness to wave the flag of surrender just because apparently or declaredly sanctions are not working. You've made great points, all three of you today. And Josh's report is indeed going to be a building block in this effort to seek a new paradigm in our approach to North Korea. Um, let me say that I'm delighted that um, our board member, Dr. Nicholas Seberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute has joined us today together with many other good friends, including um, Lee hyun Sung. A, a former North Korean, um, former senior official uh, within the uh, hard currency procurement machinery of, of the North Korean regime. He's also a co-author of a recent HRNK report, which I co-authored with him and Raymond Ha on North Korean overseas workers in China and Russia. Um, Hyunsung says that according to multiple South Korean media outlets, uh, several South Korean companies sold ships and purchased coal from North Korea. And aides of the current opposition leader delivered cash to North Korean officials. It has also been rumored that the previous Moon Jae-in administration provided crude oil and cash during the Inner Korean summit. Are there any reasons why Korean companies and politicians should be excluded from secondary sanctions? In order to make sanctions fair, shouldn't sanctions be imposed not only on Chinese and Russian companies, but also South Korean companies and South Korean politicians who have apparently violated UN sanctions? We'll go to Josh first and then to Sue and, and, and Bill. You know, as a lawyer, my clients tell me the answer they like the least is it depends. But I'm afraid I must answer that it depends. Sanctions are a tool that if wielded excessively can be dulled. They are for those who either willfully break the law 
as I think some of these South Korean actors have in fact done, um, and and we will I, I'd like to get into those cases in a little bit more specificity, but they are for cases in which diplomacy is not a good alternative, and in which other nations that uh, uh, of which those countries are or or those nationals or citizens fail to act. Um, the the questioner refers to um, this mafia figure, I would call him, who is currently under indictment in South Korea uh, and was apparently or allegedly an associate of opposition leader uh, Lee Jae-myung. Um, the allegation is that he made $8 million in payments uh, related to investments in North Korea and that there was an under the table bargain to buy Lee Jae-myung a summit had he won the last presidential election and had he done so, uh, we might be looking at our second candlelight revolution in just a few years. Um, so look, I would say that that prosecution is ongoing in South Korea and whenever an allied nation is willing to prosecute a violator, then that is the best course. Uh, on the other hand, the questioner refers to uh, 2018 reports that South Korea was buying coal from North Korea. I suspect it was probably smuggled through the Russian ports of Holmsk or Nakhodka, which have historically been smuggling hubs for North Korean coal. The coal that is smuggled through Russia was reportedly packaged in a unique way that would have been detectable to the South Korean state energy company that was buying it. And of course, North Korea sells anthracite coal, which is chemically unlike most of the bituminous and lignite coal that is mined and sold in the region. So the, the South Korean energy company should have known it was buying North Korean coal. Um, there has been some accountability for this. I believe three low-level officials were prosecuted I'm not completely satisfied that that investigation was completed. The case of the sale of the ships, I my memory of that case is too vague to comment on in detail. I will say, however, that there was another case in which the Moon administration was encouraging investments in North Korea and a Treasury undersecretary had to schedule a call with a bunch of South Korean bankers and threaten them with sanctions because clearly in the Moon administration, we had an administration that was uh, encouraging violations of the sanctions or frankly propagating absolutely absurd interpretations of the sanctions that were designed to undermine them. So um, look, I, I would prefer to let the South Korean justice system handle these matters to the extent that it is not keeping up its obligations under the UN resolutions, South Korea should be no more exempt than any other nation. Thank you, Josh. Sue, any thoughts on this question? Well, um, I agree with, with, uh, with Josh in that I, I don't think allied countries should be exempt from secondary sanctions or being called out. Um, otherwise, there would be loopholes. And North Korea being fully aware of the um, the leanings of, um, I would say, the aggressive or left-leaning governments in South Korea would be taking advantage of them. And what is the utility of sanctions if there are gaps that can't be filled because of a country's allied status? And of course, we should be exhausting um, the national systems of, of South Korea before we pursue um, these, these broader measures that would have, I think, further reaching effects. But I, I do agree that um, they, should be not, they should not be exempt um, from scrutiny, from sanctions, but also just being held accountable. Thank you very much, Sue. And Bill, you have been following North Korea at least since the end of the Cold War, if not for longer. Okay, how do you feel about this? I, I don't mean to shift the focus to these uh, pay-to-play schemes, but they do go back to the 2000 uh, inter-Korean summit. Um, according to good friends of ours, uh, Don Kirk, Kim Ki-sum, 
well, half a billion dollars went up north. The figure appears to have been 1.5 billion. Uh, what is there to be done in order to ensure some consistency? Because we, we see these wild swings in, in South Korea's approach to North Korea uh, policy, depending on basically who's in power. Uh, good question, Greg. And yeah, I followed that. Um, if we go back to the 2000s, the, one of the more terrible parts about that bribe was that perhaps a third of that money went directly into the pockets of the North Korean military. Um, and and that's, that's treason, you know, my view, absolute treason. I understand the role that presence play in uh, diplomacy and in dealing with North Korea. You don't get a meeting without a bribe. And then they held, held up the South Korean, uh, they held up the Blue House uh, at the last minute to get more. Uh, I understand all that, but there comes a time when you say no. And evidently a lot of South Korean politicians uh, don't have that word in their vocabulary. So that, that's a shame. Uh, I also think that this, it happened in six party talks. The Chinese would give North Korea money every time they came to Beijing, right? So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's built into the system and we, we need to uh, scourge it out, right? Take uh, some rough sandpaper and, and start eliminating some of this. When they would go to sort of the uh, two track, one and a half track meetings, for North Korean officials, they were shopping trips, right? And their way was paid. So, you know, you, if, if they want to participate, they ought to be paying their own way. Goodness gracious, why aren't we doing it, right? Uh, so that they can go and, and shop in London and so forth as uh, Madam, I won't mention exactly who, did. So all of this, I, I think we need to change the rules of the game, right? Otherwise, we're engaged in a, in a case of moral hazard, uh, which is to be avoided uh, finally, I guess. And just I'll, I'll end right here with a quick word. It's not an echo chamber. I agree with Josh that you should let the country handle these prosecutions itself because they're violations of its own laws and regulations. But it is very, very helpful to have the uncertain threat of say, secondary sanctions hanging over the issue. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. And Josh, from secondary sanctions to all of the other uh, recommendations that you make in this report, again, they need to become a cornerstone of a new approach to sanctions and North Korea policy. And that said, as you highlight in the report, the issues we address are very straightforward. We are dealing with a population, the overwhelming majority of the population of North Korea is oppressed, exploited, and malnourished. One third of their children, and as you highlight in the report, on the other hand, the elites, including the inner core of the Kim family regime, uh, indulge in uh, expensive wines, cognac, food, yachts, uh, Mercedes and other expensive luxury cars. And yes, as you point out in the report, surprise, even in the purchase of two elephants from Zimbabwe, which is absolutely insane. If you think of the differences between the haves and the have nots in a republic that claims to be the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, it is not democratic, it is not a republic, and it does not belong to the people. Josh uh, and Sue and Bill, let me go back to all of you for quick concluding remarks. Uh, in, in particular, what, what interests uh, all of us is this impression that the sanctions are meant to hurt the people of North Korea. I always give the example of Josh Stanton, who went through great pains as he was designing legislation to ensure that the ordinary people of North Korea were actually protected and that the sanctions were not targeting them. Josh, you make a very important point about transparency in your report. So let me go back to each and every one of you for very quick concluding remarks. Josh, you're up first. I, I, I think that Sue and Bill both 
drove it really honed in on a key point, which is coordination. That the the interagency coordination, the whole of government leadership and the global leadership have always been lacking here. There has never been a single sanctions coordinator for North Korea who has had even a rough understanding of the commerce and treasury and customs and DOJ authorities over uh, commerce with North Korea as it crosses through the, the hub of commerce in the United States. Uh, nor has there been an understanding of how you replicate that onto a global scale and reconcile this false choice again between a state that is determined not to use its its wealth to benefit the people and um, an international community that is threatened by how this regime does use that wealth. So look, we know that the Biden administration is capable of building coalitions and exercising effective leadership. It did it in Ukraine. It can do it in North Korea. I fear that what it does not fully understand is what happens if we simply allow North Korea to be accepted as a nuclear state and to have a nuclear monopoly over our treaty allies in South Korea and Japan. They have got to focus hard on North Korea's ideology, its intentions, its actions, and uh, and the consequences of this. What what does this lead to? This could be one of the greatest humanitarian tragedies of the coming century, uh, and and also in other continents, in places as far away as Syria or the Congo. North Korea, and through its actions, has done great harm to people in faraway places. And we have got to deny North Korea the choice to, again, use our commercial and financial systems to do this harm to us and to innocent people in its own country and in other countries. Josh, thank you. Sue, quick final thoughts. Sure. Um, I agree with Josh. Coordination is very important. I think the biggest takeaway is, again, I, I'm, I keep honing in on like morals and ethics, but this is, it is a moral problem. It is an ethical problem. And we need to remember that every action that we take, however small, is going to bear consequences on the North Korean population. We focus on the Kim Jong-un regime because this is the person that we deal with. But behind the scenes, the human shields, as Josh, as Josh called them, they're there and they're, they have risked their lives to, you know, maybe not voluntarily, but because they don't have a choice. And every action that we take has consequences on them. And we seem to forget that we talk about the North Korean people, but I don't really understand. I don't really know how much of that really resonates with us when we actually make decisions. It does have reaching effects on them and we need to remember them and also just keep them you know, alive as we're formulating policy and as we're hashing out solutions to, to handle this, the regime problem, the nuclear problem, the hunger problem, everything that pertains to North Korea. Thank you very much, Sue, Bill. Well, thank you. Uh, first and very briefly, uh, the sanctions that were applied against Iraq and the horror that they caused, uh, was the reason that the United Nations started looking into sanctions and their impact and why uh, with the very first sanctions resolution on North Korea, 1718 in, in 2006, they were called targeted sanctions. They were not the comprehensive sanctions. But if we look at the, uh, the trace of sanctions over time, they are becoming more and more comprehensive to get at the funding of the North Korean prohibited programs. And so uh, the effect on the populace itself, narrow in the beginning, has widened and deepened. And so it, it is crucial to bear in mind, um, this, this, if we could call them, the secondary effects of these kinds of sanctions. Not all of these broad sanctions 
hurt the populace. Forbidding the export of food actually increased the supply of food inside North Korea. So um, I, th I think that um, the complaints, the protestations of Russia and China are worth the breath used to express them. Look at how they treat their own people and others. Um, I think is strictly a political move. And finally, as a last comment, I would like everyone to look at the short name of the proposed legislation Josh drafted. Put it in your Google Translate. See what it says in Korea. Josh is trying to offer North Korean people a future. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. Mire, the Mire legislation, the future indeed. Uh, Josh, Sue, Bill, thank you so much. This has been terrific. What we need is indeed vision, coordination, and leadership. And we all know that this is going to be just the beginning. Uh, we'll have to get together. We'll have, we'll have to create a nucleus of uh, expert and like-minded individuals who will look into implementing the recommendations that Josh has included in his report. Josh, thank you. Terrific efforts. Sue, Bill, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Uh, have a wonderful evening and uh, a wonderful afternoon on the West Coast. Thank you.